and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 175, Rommel Knows Best. Last time, as the fighting to the south and southeast of Tobruk came down to simple attrition, Rommel, believing he and his had inflicted more damage than they actually had, decided to take the fight to the Commonwealth forces closer to the frontier wire, the former line between the two forces. Problem was, General Cunningham, leader of the British Eighth Army, equally thinking he had the Axis forces on the ropes, but starting to glean that this was not completely true by the night of November 23rd, decided to send reinforcements west by the Via Balbia, close to the coast, and the Trig Campuzo, a road just to the south of it. In essence, both commanders were sending their offensive units to each other's backyard, by different routes. Cunningham had also decided that he was willing to lose all of his armor, if that meant Rommel lost all of his as well. After all, he had more men and would then be able to use them to push the Germans and the Italians back west. Besides, he still had the men and tanks of Tobruk to add to his might once they were freed, whereas Rommel was willing to lose some of his panzers through the normal process of combat, but one didn't think it would come to that, and two, his field guns were demonstrating their worth much to his satisfaction. No, the British would be thrown out of Libya, their men and tanks crushed south of Tobruk, and then the invasion of Egypt proper could begin. Rommel had ordered that the Panzers be ready to move out by 10 a.m. the next day, November 24th. Yet these men and their machines had been put through the ringer for the last five days, and were exhausted. Rommel didn't have time for that. Just after the deadline had passed, he took command of Ravenstein's 21st Panzer Division, the only unit ready, and dashed off at 10.40 a.m. General Gauze and Cruvel were ordered to follow just as soon as they could. Rommel made it clear he expected the 15th Panzer Division to be on the road soonest, so the 15th headed out soon after him. The Italians of the Ariete Division would be behind them. Just before he departed, Rommel left Lt. Col. Vestfall in charge of Panzer Group Headquarters and told his subordinate that this would all be over in 36 hours or so. But the generals under Rommel were not of the same mind. When Rommel started out to the south, just below the city of Zeg airfield, he had the Ariete Division on his right, but the British 22nd Armor Brigade on his left. The 22nd fired off what shots they could as Rommel drove past, but did not pursue, as it was a much larger force. The Ariete Division was on the lookout for the 1st South African, who were further to the south, and they, like the 22nd, took shots at Rommel as he went by. Yet they soon found themselves engaged with the Italians. By the time Rommel reached the Trig El Abd and turned left to head east, the South Africans were far behind him. It must be said that when it came time for the South Africans to engage, they were still recovering from the previous day's mauling. As for the 22nd to the north, they had their orders to start forming a defensive line that ran from just above them to the south. And as it seemed clear that Rommel was going far beyond this line, the 22nd stayed in place and reported the Germans' movement. Once Rommel, with the 15th and 21st Panzer Divisions in tow, reached the Trig El Abd, there was nothing to stop him from heading east. Nothing. That is to say, except for parts of the 8th Army's headquarters and logistics units. But they, understandably, vacated the area ahead of Rommel, fleeing to the east, hoping Rommel would stop at some point. Understandably, some of those units retreating did not stop until they reached Matru, some 100 miles away. Fortunately for the Commonwealth forces, their field maintenance units for the 30th Corps, flushed with supplies, was just to the south of the Trig El Abd and hidden pretty well. Hence, Rommel did not know of their existence. Had he, it can be safely presumed, a detachment would have been sent out after it, making Cunningham's life that much harder. 
Driving east, Rommel was being Rommel. He was taking the fight to the enemy, hoping to show up in an unexpected location to scatter all before him and take much-needed enemy supplies. As for his men and generals, that was a different story. The German and Italian soldiers, caught up in the last five days of this ever-changing battle for the airfield and Tobruk, were exhausted. Moreover, their leaders, just under Rommel, felt that victory was only possible if the British, hopefully more tired than their own men, didn't put up too much of a fight. Still, orders were orders. As word was sent back east, the RAF was ordered to slow Rommel down, if not stopping him outright. But that did not happen. Though it was known what route Rommel was taking, and in which direction he was heading, actually finding him was not that simple. It was a large area, and identification was difficult, with the many fleeing logistics units near Rommel. Besides, once the RAF was told that Rommel was on the move, they were not given any follow-up detailed reports. Those that could have spied his location were too busy running pell-mell to the east ahead of the panzers. The bombers flew all over, but achieved very little that day of November 24th. And by that night, their bases had to be pulled back further east, lest Rommel come upon them and destroy the aircraft while on the ground. After all, no one knew where Rommel was headed. Driving east, scattering all before him, Rommel and his panzers reached the frontier wire by 4 p.m. There he stopped, but sent von Ravenstein's headquarter escort unit on ahead to Sidi Suleiman, another 12 miles away. With that done, Ravenstein's men would be about 10 miles away from Major Bach, who still held the Halfaya Pass to the northeast along the coast for Rommel. Things were shaping up nicely. As for the 5th Panzer Regiment, still behind Rommel, it reported in at 6 p.m. that not only were they out of fuel and ammunition, they had been given a hard time passing by the artillery of the South Africans and the 22nd Armor Brigade, and the RAF who found them while looking for Rommel, but that they were stopping for the night, still short of the frontier wire, to deal with their casualties. Rommel bit his tongue, but hoped some of their remaining 20 medium tanks would make their way to him that night to give him more options the next day. As for the 15th Panzer Division behind the 5th Panzer Regiment, they were not as shot up, still losing some tanks to the Commonwealth guns, and now down to 40 vehicles, when they too reported in, settling down still 12 miles away from the frontier. It seems that they were able to take advantage of the British and Africans using most of their shells on the 15th Regiment. As for the Italians of the Ariete Division, they were even further behind after dealing with the shell-shocked South Africans. They, the Italians, offered up a whole host of reasons for their relative slowness, which mattered little to Rommel. All he knew was that they were behind schedule. As had happened for the last few days, the Germans' communications fell apart. After all, the advancing troops were getting ordered around by three different commanders, Rommel, Cruvel, and Westphal, back at El Abdin. What's more, those signals were higgledy-piggledy, as luck, more than anything else, would allow someone along the German line to pick up a message to pass it on, not knowing if the message was received, and if it was, was it done correctly. The panzers sent north by Rommel after reaching the frontier wire rumbled around between the trigged El Ab and the northern coast, getting into fights only after bumping into enemy units. This was how November 25th was spent for those panzers, not immediately attached to Rommel. The next day, November 26th, was only more of the same. Rommel, due to a lack of communications and intelligence, still believed that Godwin Austin's 13th Corps was still around the frontier garrisons, which is where Rommel believed the decisive fighting would take place. His best option, it seemed, was to drive the British tanks and infantry into the nearby swamp of German landmines. In reality, the 4th Indian Division was already in his rear to his northwest, 
holding much of his supposed territory. By the end of the 26th, with communications still beyond spotty, the 15th and 21st Panzer Divisions pushed on to Bardia, along the coast, for relative security, rest, and to refuel. That, however, had not been their orders. They were not getting orders from Rommel, who could not reach them. It was made worse for the Axis formations that the RAF had come screaming back that day of the 26th, literally bombing any tanks they came upon. And even this was a calculated risk. As Rommel had two panzer divisions hard upon the frontier wire, and Cunningham was getting a clearer idea of how many tanks he had lost thus far, the RAF bombers and fighters had been told to bomb or strafe any armored units they spotted, the odds being they were German. This gamble paid off as Rommel lost more panzers on the 26th. During the 25th and 26th, as Rommel was making his daring raid, which was a lot less daring by now, the New Zealanders had traveled west, north of the attacking panzers, along the Trig Capuzzo. But instead of hitting the Germans during the day, who could use their impressive artillery to inflict advanced stopping casualties, they instead hit the enemy at night with quiet bayonet attacks. The 4th New Zealand Brigade traveled the Trig Campuzo until reaching Belhamad, just north of the road and north of the airfield, taking the German garrison held by the Africa Division. However, the 6th New Zealand Brigade, when they laid into the Italians of the Bersaglieri Division, were unable to shift them from the city Rizeg Ridge. The plan had been to take the ridge and then move on to Ed Duda, just five miles south-southeast of Tobruk, to open a gateway. Yet the Italians, with their first-class guns, held the New Zealanders back. General Scobie at Tobruk either got a message of this close-by fighting or heard the guns and decided to help himself. Using the newly renamed 70th Division, Scobie pushed out further to the southeast and surprised the garrison at Eduna, taking the fortification. The excess troops there were not expecting an attack from their rear. Thus motivated by this, the New Zealand 6th attacked again, again at night, and finally pushed the Italians off the ridge, their guns firing wildly and inaccurately into the darkness. Late on November 26th, while the Panzers rested and refueled at Bardia, the New Zealanders and the men of Scobie finally shook hands. To Brooke, it seemed, was rescued. As the Italians fled the heights, they reported their situation to Colonel Westfall at El Abden, who got word to Rommel. This was a disaster of the First Order. Rommel, though still dreaming of pushing into Egypt with tens of thousands of prisoners of war and their supplies, picked up on the nervousness in the plethora of messages coming to him. Clearly, something had to change. Egypt was out, for now. Late on the 26th, Rommel ordered von Ravenstein and his 21st Panzer to head back west, along the Via Balbia, close to the coast, to shore up the breakout at Tobruk. The men and Panzers would head out early the next day. As for Newman Silkow and the 15th Panzer Division, they would stay in the area to continue to harass and tie down nearby Commonwealth forces. Though he couldn't have Egypt, for now, he would not give up what he had captured. Before the sun rose on November 27th, Bardia's roads to the south and west were clogged with German vehicles, as the 21st Panzer tried to head west while the 15th attempted to go to the south. Simply, the officers and men of both Panzer divisions were punch-drunk with fatigue. No one could get their formation headed in the right direction, not in a time that would make Rommel happy. Eventually, the 15th Panzer headed southwest, opting to make their own way. This put them on a course that ran right into the headquarters of the 5th New Zealander Brigade, which they captured. Hopefully, this would lessen the wrath of Rommel. As for Ravenstein and the 21st, they finally got all their vehicles pointing the right way on the Via Balbia 
and headed west, hoping to hit Freiburg's New Zealanders in their rear. And yet the panic signals from Westfall kept coming to Rommel. This caused him to abandon attacks near the frontier, as he ordered the 15th to head west as well, along the Trig Campuzo, the center of the three main roads or paths that ran west to east. What Rommel couldn't know, because no intelligence unit had the time to find out, was that Cunningham was no longer in charge of the British 8th Army. Auchinleck had returned to Cairo on the 25th, generally happy with Cunningham, not overall satisfied with events so far, but rather how Cunningham had adapted to the ever-changing events, mostly his desire to fight on. This, no doubt, would please Churchill. Still, something wasn't quite right, an inner voice informed him. This nagging stayed with the C&C. So, sharing his concerns with Air Marshal Tedder, Oliver Littleton, Minister of State, and Arthur Smith, his Chief of Staff, they reviewed the last week's work with a detached attitude. What it came down to was that Cunningham had lost Auchinleck's confidence, an oft-used term that could mean many things. Basically, the CNC was listening to that voice that told him Cunningham was not the man. But who was going to replace him? Godwin Austin and Major General Norrie of the 1st Armored Division were solid men, but besides being in the thick of it at the moment, didn't seem to have the flair yet for a higher command. No, to Auchinleck's mind, there was only one man nearby who would temporarily straighten out this situation. That was Major General Neil Ritchie, the CNC's Deputy Chief of General Staff. His rank should have been higher, but he had been instrumental in planning Operation Crusader. He had the experience at HQ level. Ritchie was sent to Fort Magdalena to take command of 8th Army. But, once again, Auchinleck had chosen the wrong man. Yet this would not be apparent for some time. When Cunningham received word that he was relieved, he accepted it with professionalism, mixed with exhaustion. Taking himself to Cairo, he entered the hospital to recoup his nerve. With Rommel and his men and panzers running around the frontier area, accomplishing little, the British had gathered themselves to his rear. Units had coalesced, equipment was repaired, and most importantly, replacement tanks arrived in the forward areas. All these combined renewed the fighting spirit of the men and their officers. It was early on the 27th that Godwin Austin was told that two German panzer divisions were coming at him from the east. Again, this was erroneously reported as a German withdrawal. Really, it was only a tactical retreat. Now, truly motivated, Godwin Austin strengthened Edduna, Balamed, and City Rezeg, knowing that's where the Germans and Italians would head. What's more, in preparation, the southern escarpment just south of the airfield was cleared, except for point 178, to the southwest of the airfield. There, the Germans and Italians, under General Bocker, used their artillery to keep the would-be victors away. And that was as best as Godwin Austin could do, for now. He turned to ready for the approaching panzers, by strengthening his rear guards. But to his annoyance, General Bacher's men continued to shell nearby Commonwealth forces. Before being told of the returning panzers on the morning of the 27th, Godwin Austin had already assessed his tactical situation and found it wanting. His artillery were down to 50 rounds each, and those damn guns on point one seven eight would not stop firing at his men. He needed more shells, and he needed point one seven eight cleared. Calling into headquarters, he asked that the 1st South African Brigade be used to push Bakker off the heights, and for more of everything. Both requests got the assent, and soon a 200-vehicle-strong convoy was en route. As for the South African Division, General Pinar informed headquarters that it was still shaken up by the loss of the 5th Brigade and the general drubbing the Germans had given them. Officially, Pinar's reason was the instability of the overall situation, 
with the panzers bearing down at City Rezeg. Either way, his answer was no. General Norrie's 1st Armored Division had spent the 26th taking out or capturing wayward Axis tanks that had run out of gas or had gotten lost in no man's land, in between Bardia and the airfield. Cruvel could not help thinking, as reports came in, of his bleeding men, that he would have liked to have done the same to the British, instead of seeking glory with Rommel. Also on that day, the badly mauled 7th Armor Brigade was ordered back to Egypt for rest and refitting. It would be the refreshed 4th and 22nd Armor Brigades that would greet the coming panzers. Between the two, they now had some 120 tanks, and hoped this would be enough to finally have the decisive tank battle Cunningham had sought days ago. As the two British brigades had been south of the Trick Campuzo when they got the word of the coming panzers, the now defending British armored forces would be coming upon the road from the south. As for the artillery of the support group and the infantry units of the 22nd Brigade, they were once again separated from the armor and moved into no man's land to take over the task of clearing out any stranded Axis forces. Their other duty, along with the jock columns in between the Panzers and British tanks, were to hit the German tanks as they traveled west. Hopefully they would bleed and weaken the 21st and 15th Panzers before the British tanks got to hit them. The question was, was this a sound policy, especially after the beating the 7th Armored had taken due to not having their artillery support? Who can say? But the decision was made. The infantry and large guns moved to the east, still south of Trig Campuzo. Around noon on November 27th, the Panzers with their guns and transport trucks in close proximity, reached an area just shy of being within striking range. As such, Gott ordered the 22nd to attack the leading German forces, knowing or hoping that by blocking the leaders, the rest of the line would get tangled up. Meanwhile, the 4th Armor Brigade would hit the jumbled and hopefully confused German forces on its left flank. The Panzers came on the 22nd, engaged them. But again, not having their own guns, they were unable to effectively deal with the German anti-tank guns that were brought forward and to the left flank when the 4th Armored arrived. The Germans were slowed down, but not stopped. Still, Cruvel was worried enough about the situation to order the 21st Panzer, currently traveling slightly to the north of the 15th, to join up, to deflect the British. The two panzer divisions were joined, but before any serious advance could be attempted, darkness came. The British, per their M.O., moved a bit away to settle down for the night. However, this time, there were no artillery units to cover for them as they slept. Their guns were to the east. As the early part of the night went on, the British tank crews spoke of the damage they had done that day and of stopping the Germans. The jock columns to their east radioed in that they had equally, if not more so, mauled the Ariete division as they followed behind the Germans. The day had been good for the Allies, but that night was about to be claimed by the Axis. As the British rested, though some of their tanks stayed alert, Newman Silkow saw his chance and pushed on into the night. The few remaining British tanks tried to stop them, but were no match. Not until later in the night did the Panthers come to a rest, but by then they were just before point one seven five, on the ridge just north of the airfield, to its northeast, yet just south of the Trig Capuzo. At point one seven five is where some of the New Zealanders had made camp, having recently won control of it. At dawn on november twenty eighth, the British tanks got moving again to locate and destroy the Panzers, who were trying to close the recently opened door to Tobruk. Yet by the time the British armor found their German counterparts, they discovered the Panzers were ringed with their anti-tank guns, all the more on a part of the escarpment, just south of the Trig Campuzo Road, 
but north of the airfield. And as the guns of the British were further to the east, the 22nd and 4th Armored were unable to directly attack the Germans, without it quickly becoming a suicide mission. The rest of the 28th was spent, by both sides, consolidating their current positions. Ironically, their current positions were, roughly, what they were a week ago. Rommel was trying to bring his forces together, then, after finding the Commonwealth's weak point, to go after it with overwhelming force. Whereas the British, in control of City Rezeg, this time with New Zealanders, and with Ritchie leading them instead of Cunningham, were attempting to build up their forces to, one, make sure the Germans could not retreat completely, which they weren't trying to do, and two, to help break out their comrades from Tobruk. Yet Rommel thought he had found his attack point. With the enemy's artillery and infantry support to the east, the New Zealanders around City Rezeg were pretty much on their own. And as the Germans had their tanks and guns working closely together, this gave him a tactical advantage. Freiburg's men would be wiped out, or captured, which would cause the Allied forces to the north, currently connected to the men of Tobruk at Eduna, to have their southern flank open. The Panzers would push on west, take City Rezeg and the New Zealanders, then turn north and close the door once again to Tobruk. The British tanks all the while would be held up by Rommel's anti-tank guns. But if the British armor chose to attack, so much the better for the Desert Fox. Of course, his men had their own problems as well. This fight, this first extended battle for City Rezeg, had left his men bereft of energy, their equipment just hanging on. Still, Cruvel, waiting for word from Rommel as to what to do on the 29th, and not receiving any, made his own dispositions for the coming battle. As usual, Rommel's orders came, but too late to implement. The Germans and Italians already had their orders of the day from Cruvel, and he had truly taken a page from Rommel's book for his daring plan. Not only would the New Zealanders be crushed, but so too would the two armor brigades. Also, if all went according to plan, Point 175 and El Duda to the northwest would once again be in German hands, if all went according to plan. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 176, Stalin Steps In for Lenin. Last time, as Lenin led his faction of the Bolshevik Party against anyone wanting to hold back the February Revolution, including the Mensheviks, the other Bolsheviks, and War Minister Kerensky, the new face of the provisional government, that entity with the support of the Petrograd Soviet, believed they had come upon a plan to win back the hearts and minds of the citizens. A new offensive against Germany. That this was the very last thing most citizens and soldiers wanted was beside the point. Those in power had convinced themselves that this was the will of the people and not their own. But they would soon discover the truth. As if the Russian people weren't stunned enough by this, the Pravda, with Stalin at its head, published the war profits made by Russian factories, which confirmed for the people whose side the Petrograd Soviet, the Constitutional Democratic Party, and the Provisional Government was on. To the powers that be, this new offensive would help Russia at the negotiating table when the war was won. For clearly there was no way Britain and France would allow anything but a complete crushing of the Germans. Only Lenin and like-minded groups truly grasped the will of the people. And as Lenin could not stop the offensive from coming, his position was to simply let events play out and reap the rewards. Again, Lenin was not a soft-hearted person. If a few more thousand Russian soldiers died, so much the better for him and his. 
Kerensky's offensive started on June 18th, July 1st in the West, due to the difference in the calendars, with a two-day continuous artillery barrage. Their main target was Austria-Hungary, the supposed weak point of the Central Powers. Then the Russian soldiers moved forward, or rather, some of them did. Those that did were able to push back the shocked Germans before them. As for the other Russian units, they did not follow orders to advance. Moreover, some of them killed their commanders. Others held meetings as to discuss what should be done. Be that as it may, those that did move forward were soon pushed back by the now angered enemy troops. Slaughter at the hands of the Germans followed the slaughter carried out by the Russian guns. As the Germans counterattacked and the Russians gave ground, the attackers found themselves moving deeper into Russia. Soon the Ukraine was occupied. Any Russian troops that did anything other than retreat were destroyed. As the Russian lines collapsed, the respect and authority of those moderate socialists of the Petrograd Soviet equally disintegrated. When the men of the Soviet Executive Committee ordered the soldiers to turn around and fight, they themselves were thrashed and arrested by the soldiers. As one historian wrote later, the whole of 1917 could be seen as a political battle between those who saw the revolution as a means of bringing the war to an end and those who saw the war as a means of bringing the revolution to an end. Clearly, the former were winning, including Lenin and his faction. When Lenin had returned to Russia, he was the radical, the extremist. But that was no more. His words had come true. The provisional government, as he had claimed, only wanted power. Power over German territory, touching Russia, and power over the people. Their war was only to get both, yet that had failed. For all of Lenin's hard-heartedness, he was now seen by many as the only true Russian patriot. As further proof of the changing winds of fortune, Lev Trotsky now sided with Lenin. This was quite the change, as Trotsky had been heckling Lenin since his arrival from North America, one month after Lenin returned. Now the younger, passionate man stood beside Lenin and demanded that power be given immediately to the Soviets. And yet, Lenin and his faction were about to collapse under the weight of Kerensky's revenge. After the failed Russian offensive, the army became even more fragmented. There were those who followed orders and those that did not. But even more, the massive Russian army broke down into various national armies. Ukrainian, Finnish, Lithuanian, Estonian, Georgian, Armenian, Crimean Tartar. These new cracks would one day be formalized when the Russian Empire itself broke apart. Even more was the provisional government hated and seemingly helpless. By July, it appeared that Lenin had won, that power would come to him. As the Constitutional Democrats parted ways from the coalition provisional government on July 2nd, and word spread that the capital's garrison would be sent to the front to shore it up, Lenin's Bolsheviks seemed on the cusp of authority. To further this, a machine gun regiment and sailors from Kronstadt rushed through Petrograd streets, occupying key positions, all the while yelling, All power to the Soviets! To make sure the terror was maintained, which froze many potential nemesis, hundreds were shot down, hundreds more were seriously wounded. The only thing that saved Kerensky's life at this moment was that he was at the front, extolling the men to not abandon Russia and the, his, provisional government. On July 4th, a large crowd had gathered at the Terriot Palace. They yelled for the leader of the Soviet to come out. But when Viktor Chernov, the Socialist Revolutionary Party leader, emerged instead, the people demanded for him to take power, that they would be his weapons. Chernov demurred, so he was arrested by the armed sailors and soldiers. Now was the moment Lenin and those with him had waited for for so long. Yet, they hesitated. Where was Lenin at this moment? No one knows. 
but soon a torrential rain came down, chasing this citizen army away. Later, Chernov was rescued. With their moment having passed, when Kerensky was told of this, he charged the Bolsheviks with treason, which would not have fazed the people so much. But there was a second charge, of aiding a foreign enemy. During this latest crisis, and just before it, the Bolsheviks were putting out 300,000 issues of various papers, including the Pravda, each day. Besides this, they published hundreds of thousands of pamphlets as well. How was the party of whatever factions paying for this? With German money. On July 5th, documents proving Lenin and the Bolshevik officials received payments from Germany were published. To be sure, Lenin would have taken money from anyone to print his propaganda. To him, the end justified the means. The question was, was he working for the Germans? Yet, that's not how he saw it. He was simply taking resources offered to him to further his quest. That it benefited his country's enemy did not faze him. After all, he believed that Germany would be going through its own February Revolution soon enough. But now that he had been caught red-handed, he told Trotsky, they are going to shoot us. It is the most advantageous time for them. There was no hysterics. Lenin was playing the game. He had been doing well. He had almost gotten away with it. But now he was found out and would pay the price. If the situation was reversed, he would have done the same. The next day, July 6th, the Provisional Government's Counter Espionage Bureau invaded the Pravda's offices and smashed their presses. While this happened, Russian troops stormed into the Bolshevik central meeting place, the former mansion of Kerenska. Inside were 400 well-armed Bolsheviks, but they surrendered without a fight. With the troops were arrest warrants for 28 of the highest-ranking Bolsheviks, but Lenin was not to be found. Having been tipped off, he was still a hero to many. The leader of his faction snuck out before the raid to where Stalin had spent much of his time, the Alubnyev family apartment. Stalin had arranged this. Later, Lenin would run further away to Russian Finland, along with his comrade Zinoviev. While in Finland, Lenin would write State and Revolution. In it, he declared that states were nothing more than apparatuses that helped one class dominate another. What the working people needed in general, and the Russian peasants in particular, was their own state, the dictatorship of the proletariat. Its job would to be to turn the tables and suppress their current ruling class. During this time, the state, in the form of two groups appointed by the provisional government, gathered information to be used as evidence against Lenin and his closest supporters. Kerensky returned to the capital on July 6th, and though his offensive against the Germans would falter, his offensive against the Lenin-led faction of the Bolsheviks went much better. As the trial was prepared for by the state, some 800 Bolsheviks were arrested, but not Lenin. He had already fled, but neither too was Stalin put into shackles. The why of this has never truly been discovered. Clearly, he was known as a Lenin protege. All within the capital knew that bloodshed was coming for the Bolsheviks, but who could tell who would be next? This was too much for the supposed prime minister, Prince Gorgi Lvov. He stepped down, saying, In order to save the country, it is now necessary to shut down the Soviet and shoot all the people. I cannot do that. Kerensky can and so the former war minister became the prime minister. But Kerensky wasn't the only one seizing the moment and seizing power. As acting prime minister, Kerensky made General Kornilov the commander of the southwestern front. This also made him the supreme commander. Then Kerensky announced that the death penalty was back for refusing commands or for speaking out against a superior. As for who would enforce this, no one seemed to want the job. Yet in that same month of July, when Kerensky fired General Borsilov and put Kornilov in his place, the new army commander made it clear that he relished the idea of straightening out 
the Russian army. But then, turning on his political master, Kornilov demanded from Kerensky, he was the only one that really mattered within the provisional government, that his was to be an independent command. All decisions would be made by him. Word of this reached the press, and those on the right cheered to have someone who would take a firm hand against the army, with its unacceptable delusions of democracy. Yet when this demand of Kornilov reached Kerensky's desk, it sat there. July went by, the agreement still unsigned. By mid-August, Kornilov realized he was being judged, and that now Kerensky was worried about the man he had elevated. Soon, distrust settled over the entire situation, as it was left lingering. During this time, the Bolshevik party, naturally worried over its future, assembled in the form of a party congress, starting on July 26th. It was their sixth meeting overall, and would last until August 3rd. Some 267 attendees appeared, of which 157 of them were voting delegates. Adding tension to this already tense assemblage, as many were threatened with arrest, the various groups came representing different goals. Some of the delegates were from faraway provinces. Others represented almost 30 frontline regiments. Others came to speak for factory workers or garrison units much closer by, and they would react accordingly if their views were ignored. As Lenin and Zinoviev were still hidden away, and Kemenev and Trotsky were jailed, this allowed Stalin the prestigious role of opening the Congress and being the first to speak. Wearing a simple gray jacket and speaking calmly, almost unhurriedly, Stalin invoked a tone that said he was unworried about being arrested. The why of that is still not known, or that he cared what the provisional government would do. His only concern seemed to be for Russia, its people, and, of course, the Bolshevik party. Stalin spoke of the well-known attacks and threats against the party, the pending trial against Lenin and many others, and the loss of political clout the party had recently enjoyed. But as he had done many times before, his speech was delivered in the form of questions and answers, answers that he would give before anyone else could speak. What is the provisional government? It is a puppet, a miserable screen behind which stand the constitutional Democrats, the military clique, and allied capital, the three pillars of counter-revolution. As such, troubling times were clearly ahead for their party. Others were then allowed to speak, to answer or refute the tone that Stalin had set, and he let them have their time to vent. But in the end, Stalin would steer this Congress, not with threats, but with the force of his personality and reasoned arguments. Near the end of the Congress, one representative suggested that the Russian Revolution be tied with the seemingly building revolutions in France and Germany, as their people wearied of war as well. But Stalin, who did not want to be second to anyone, wanted that same preeminence for Russia. His response was no. The possibility cannot be excluded that Russia will be the country that blazes the trail to socialism. He concluded, no country has hitherto enjoyed such freedom as exists in Russia. None has tried to realize the workers' control over production. He was pointing out that of the various European countries, only Russia was literally in the middle of a revolution with the true power, the Tsar, now sidelined, and the provisional government on the edge of the abyss, as it was not following the will of the peasants. As for his line of vying for control of production, that was a hint at controlling the country itself. He went on to say that in Russia, the revolution was happening now, not potentially in the future. We are battling the forces of the bourgeoisie, and we have the support of the poorest strata of the peasantry. And though poor, they were obviously the largest part of the country. He ended with, It is necessary to give up the antiquated idea that only Europe can show us the way. There is dogmatic Marxism and creative Marxism. I stand by the latter. This 
was the real Stalin, speaking tongue-in-cheek. We must use Marxism to make our vision of Russia's future a reality, but at the same time not be tied down to something someone wrote decades ago. We must adapt, but at the same time be ready to take power. Of course, he meant for the people, for the party, and for himself. And his argument won the day as to whether Russia should wait for the proletarian revolutions in the West to catch up, that vote was denied to those who wanted to take a more cautious approach. Stalin had shown his deft thinking of his ability to straddle two lines of how the party should move forward himself as well, but he was also going against Lenin. The latter had no such belief in Russia. The hidden-away leader also felt that the rest of Europe had to be dragged into the proletariat's cause. But Stalin believed they could accomplish their goals now or soon, and the rest of Europe could worry about itself. Again, as to why Stalin wasn't worried about making a big splash in the Russian capital, with a trial looming for many of his fellow Bolsheviks, is not known. But it could be that he had gleaned more from the building tension between Kerensky and Kornilov than others had. And so, he was astute and correct. The new leader of Russia was more worried about the challenge coming from his new army commander than from some now runaway political thorn. Just as had the Bolsheviks, Kerensky called for a state conference to be held in mid-August in Moscow, their ancient capital. Attending were those that mattered, the landowners, the industrialists, representatives of higher education institutions, and, of course, former Duma representatives, that supposedly spoke for some of the common people. To be sure, representatives of the Soviets, they speaking for the peasants and some of the military brass that did not trust Kerensky, also attended. The meeting started on August 12th, and it's now known that Kerensky really didn't intend to move the entire Russian political situation forward, other than confirming his position as the country's new leader. Supposedly, once this was done, he would address the various problems. And if so, he calculated badly. Right off the bat, there were the problems from the Soviet bloc that included the Bolsheviks, They were not allowed to attend, as they were not promising to go along with the Soviets' collective, whatever that may be. Yet the Bolsheviks were not done. They had a way to make their absence felt. On the first day of the meeting, there was a strike. The trams did not run, the coffee shops were not open, and the gas workers stayed home. Moscow was without lights. Kerensky and his Perhaps nemesis, Kornilov, arrived during the second day, August 13th. The next day, Kerensky asked Kornilov to speak. Yet Kornilov had his own plans. Having had an ally speak the day before, in where he told the body that not only was Riga about to fall to the Germans, the Russian capital itself was threatened by those on the left. So when Kornilov spoke, he came across, comparatively, as moderate and practical. Russia, he said, needed a strong military hand to deal with both problems. Those attending on the right cheered Kornilov. Stalin had written of Kerensky's meeting, as he knew full well, that momentum during any kind of gathering could be turned into something concrete. And that's what happened. This assembly was not to help the peasants to stave off civil war. It was for himself, an acknowledgement of his power. But that wasn't the only outcome. Those on the right made it clear that they wanted to fight against the Germans and against the peasants, in equal measure. As the shaken leader of the provisional government wrote afterward, it was clear to me that the next attempt at a coup would come from the right and not the left. And it only got worse for Kerensky. Soon after the Russian front collapsed, as the troops refused to fight, the question wasn't who would rule, but who would the victorious Germans allow to rule. At this time, many moderates and those of the right wanted Kornilov to take over, through force, and to hold the government together through force. That was the only possible answer to push the Germans back, 
The problem was, he, Kornilov, wasn't that very well liked or respected by many. For his part, Kornilov was all for it. Hang Lenin, shoot the peasants in the streets, and give the advancing Germans a good thrashing. But what then, many asked. The idea, or delusional theory, was that Kornilov would then give back power. To whom? That could be answered later. Yet the rising Kornilov had another problem. There was no one willing to keep an eye on the lower orders for him, for all knew the already angry peasants would deal with government spies quickly enough. So Kornilov believed he was being clever by working with the provisional government, as opposed to destroying it. Getting the permission of Kerensky, Kornilov had the 3rd Cavalry Corps, led by Lieutenant General Alexander Krymov, to move closer to Petrograd. Then Riga fell, as predicted, to the Germans. In reaction, Kerensky had more troops moved closer to the capital. If the Bolsheviks, or anyone else of that ilk, thought they could use the worsening war scenario as an excuse for a coup, they would find a harsh reality. As wide as the gulf was between the Bolsheviks and the provisional government, the distance only grew with the encroaching Germans and resulting political tension. But Stalin, stepping in for the absent Lenin, saw victory either way for his party. The landlords and capitalists will join us to survive, and we will win, or the proletariat will completely let us have our way, and we will win. The various powers that be throughout Russia are much, too much at each other's throats with their lack of trust to ever come back together and wipe out the Bolsheviks and other left-leaning parties. In short, Lenin would survive this latest attack. There would be no trial. The closer Kornilov got to the capital with troops in tow, the less Kerensky trusted him. Also, the closer the supreme commander got to the capital, the less he trusted his supposed superior. And the whole point of having soldiers at the capital was for Kerensky and Kornilov to join forces to fight off any Bolshevik coup. But now, with one eye on the Bolsheviks and the other on Kornilov, on August 26th, near midnight, Kerensky called an emergency cabinet meeting and asked for a full authority to fight off a counter-revolutionary plot. One has to wonder who Kerensky was getting ready to fight. Instead, the provisional government ministers resigned. All of them. Two hours later, Kornilov sent a message to Kerensky that Lieutenant General Krymov's troops were just outside Petrograd. He then advised Kerensky to put the capital under martial law. This was August 27th at 2.40 a.m. In response, not two hours later, Kornilov received a telegraph from Kerensky. He had been relieved of his position. Kornilov's staff could not believe what they were reading. Was this a trick or forgery? Either way, there could only be one response to this. The army double-timed it to the capital. That day of August 27th, Kerensky had newspapers write of Kornilov's treachery. Kornilov, in response, sent letters to the frontline commanders saying that Kerensky was now under the sway of the Bolsheviks and probably the Germans. So, where Kerensky was using words, Kornilov was asking for his fellow officers' assent to use action. Kerensky needed an opposing force. Calling on the Soviet, Kerensky had them gather their men to oppose the official Russian army. Trotsky would later write that the army that rose against Kornilov would turn out to be the army of the October Revolution. And though the two sides never came to blows, the legitimate head of the provisional government was using leftist troops to stymie the forces of the right. Incredibly, the revolution was being defended by Kerensky. Krymov was told he would have safe passage into the city, so arrived on the night of August 30th. Kerensky ordered him, as his superior, to report to a military court for his own trial. Krymov saluted, left, but instead of reporting as ordered, he went back to his apartment and killed himself. As the standoff de-evolved into a staring contest, Stalin thumped his chest. 
the counter-revolution has been shattered, and the Bolsheviks had not had to fight or bleed to make it so. Yet this was only the beginning. There were still the landowners, the capitalists, the bankers, and generals, those who had different interests than the people of Russia, those who wanted to keep land from the people of Russia. He ended an article with, For peace, for freedom, for land. That is our slogan. The creation of a government of workers and peasants. That is our task. As for Kornilov, his time had come and gone. He had been unable to outwit Kerensky because the latter had just outwitted him. Yet, in a sense, they both lost. The Russian army, overall, moved towards a socialist position. The people were already there. But now it seemed certain that whatever government took hold of the reins in Russia, it would have to be, to some extent, socialist. The country overall was moving to the left. If the next ruling entity did not grasp this, it would be torn apart by the very people it was supposed to protect. Yet Kerensky was still game. He still believed he could pull this off. Contacting the generals at the front, he asked them to name a replacement for Kornilov. Yet they would not. No one, it seemed, wanted to be a part of his government. No matter. Kerensky, tempting fate, in the extreme, chose himself to be the new military supreme commander. General Alexeyev, who Kerensky did not like or trust, was made chief of staff. Ironically, Kerensky was now in much the same position as Nicholas II when he had been running the country. And this would only continue. Twelve days after appointing Alexeyev, Kerensky fired him. By now, the 11-member provisional government was down to just himself, Kerensky. So he appointed himself to be the head of a new five-man directory, much like in revolutionary France. Yet this body, too, would not last very long. During all this, with Lenin hiding in a barn and Trotsky in jail, Stalin and Zverdlov worked together to keep their faction together. Again, the two men had no love for each other, but they had a common goal. Stalin used the newspaper, The Workers' Path, as the Pravda had been destroyed, to keep the people focused on their cause and Lenin's faction of the Bolsheviks. Meanwhile, Zverdlov kept a tight rein on the party apparatus, demanding to be sent examples of various organizations, works, and membership lists. Together, these two men would revitalize the slogan, All Power to the Soviets, which should have never worked, with the firebrand Lenin so far away. But between maintaining the rhetoric and keeping the Bolshevik cause in the faces of the peasants, they would not be allowed to forget that the revolution was not over. It would never be over until the people were in charge. <laughs> 